Hi, and welcome back to the week nine lecture here in Anthro 102, Cultural Anthropology. So for this week in the class, we have two main topics. We have the topic of medicine, which will tie to the biocultural perspective in anthropology. And we also have the topic of performance, specifically the focus on performance in society, which could include things like a rock concert, a spectacle, or even how we present ourselves to one another in our various cultures. So let's begin by looking at the first topic for this week, which is the anthropology of performance. So you'll jump to chapter 15 for this, and you can see these are the objectives that we'll be looking at this week. Let's look inside the chapter then and see exactly how anthropologists consider performance, which I would say to you that this is a somewhat untraditional or non-traditional topic to see in an anthropology class. I really appreciate it. In fact, right now I'm teaching a class called the Anthropology of Music and Sound in which we look at issues including performance. So it's a nice inclusion actually in a cultural anthro class. Again, these are the learning objectives that you can look over. And this is like a little bit of an opening anecdote about a concert and exactly what a concert might mean to us in terms of trying to unpack the cultural levels of a concert as a performance. So as they say here, performances can be many things at once. They can be artful, reflexive, and consequential while being both traditional and emergent. As a result, each performance is unique because of its specific circumstances, including its historical, social, economic, political, and personal context. Performance physical and emotional states will influence his or her performance, as will the conditions in which the performance takes place and the audience to whom the performance is delivered. And so one of the key things to think about as you begin this chapter would be your own experiences with various forms of performance in society and how you might look at those as they say here, as cultural phenomenon, as cultural performances. And connecting this to the work of Milton Singer, this is a really good section here to look at. Cultural performances might be ideal to study because they reference and encapsulate a great deal of information about the culture that gave rise to them. And two, such cultural messages become more accessible with multiple samples of these performances, as the researcher can compare and contrast the specifics between repeated performances of the same performance. And I'm pretty sure that this is a direct reference to Clifford Geertz and his study in Bali of the Balinese cockfight that he relates in the interpretation of culture. And in this particular performance, he studied these behaviors of people betting and wagering on cocks, um, fighting in these rings, often with razor blades on their feet. And when Geertz did this study, he actually looked at hundreds of performances of the cockfights and he kind of put these together in one text. And in fact, some anthropologists criticized Geertz for doing this, suggesting that he's created a form of what we call the ethnographic present, almost making you feel like you're experiencing it in the current moment, even though his research might have happened many years ago since he wrote the book or the article that became the exemplification or illustration of the research. And also he's taking bits and pieces, as they say here, of multiple performances and almost giving it to you as the reader as if it were one unified performance. So I think it's kind of interesting when anthropologists do study various performances or spectacles or activities in culture and the decisions that they make to represent those. Now the thing I will agree with, and this is also a reference to the work of Clifford Geertz, is that Performances indeed contain a ton of information about the culture that does give rise to them, and thus we can see how the interpretive approach that Geertz pioneered, as well as symbolic anthropology, going back to the work of Victor Turner, could be very relevant for the study of performance, particularly as we try to understand the embeddedness of values, of norms, of different symbols and identities that we can see emerging in forms of performance. There's a really good discussion here about the difference between cultural performance and performing culture. And they quote the work of Richard Schechner, and Schechner was someone who worked very closely with Victor Turner, the anthropologist. In fact, Turner was very interested in bringing performance to bear on alternative representations of ethnographic work. So he actually studied um, a particular group in uh, Africa called the Ndembu, and he came back to the University of Chicago where he taught and actually had students re-perform various rituals using symbolism that he acquired um, in his understanding of the interpretations of Ndembu ritual. So he has a connection certainly to the work of Richard Schechner who comes more from the world of theater and performance studies. 
So quoting Schechner here, you can differentiate between analyzing something that is a performance versus analyze something as a performance. A cultural performance is a performance, whereas performing culture refers to the ways in which our everyday words and actions are reflections of our own enculturation, and therefore can be studied as performances. So as an example, if you are doing a job interview, you might talk about how you're performing in the sense that you are trying to act a certain way, use certain language, dress a certain way to impress the person that is conducting the interview so that you maybe get the job. And this goes to the work of Irving Goffman and his notion of the presentation of self in society, which is really monumental from the world of sociology. Whereas a cultural performance, we can think of in many of the performances that we engage in when we go to a concert or a folk festival or something like this, where we see people performing in their own cultural traditions. So it's a, a little bit there of a distinction to remember. And here's an example of a type of performance in Puebla, Mexico. Cultural performances certainly include things many of us in the West often think of as performances, like concerts, plays, and dances. However, could also include things like prayer and ritual that we often classify as being part of a religious practice. There's a really good discussion of Navajo um, artwork and Navajo paintings and sand paintings and, and basketry. And sometimes there's this conversation that you might think, well, that's a form of art or that's a form of performance. And by the way, one thing that's not really done in this chapter is maybe connecting this more to what we call expressive culture in anthropology or the anthropology of art. So different people think of it in different ways. But I bring this up because sometimes we'll, we'll see something in another culture and say that's a form of art, even though for the people in that culture, they think of it as something naturally tied to their own lives and not like an art uh, process that we think of when we go to a gallery or a dance hall and we see a performance. So it's it's kind of interesting to think of that because I think sometimes people assume that what we think of as a performance in our own cultures is also going to be the same in another culture. And that's obviously not the case. Uh, they mention here two concepts that are kind of key uh, often in the social sciences, hegemony and agency. So agency means you have power as an agent to act a certain way or, or do a certain thing without maybe being coerced by another person or group of people, whereas hegemony refers to forms of power embedded in everyday life. For example, there's he hegemony that can be said in Facebook and social media, where maybe we're under the influence of various algorithms, we're posting things, and we're often maybe responding to things and getting some misinformation in the process, and that could be referred to as power embedded in systems, what we call hegemony. Now, the idea of everyday performance is really key. So everyday performance refers to all the things that we do in our everyday lives that indeed could be classified as forms of performance more generally. As they say here, culture can be seen and enacted through visible symbols embedded in behavior, gestures, body movements, and space use. And this is where we get the important work on the presentation of self by Irving Goffman. As they say here, Goffman coined the phrase presentation of self to refer to the ways in which people manage the impressions of others. So again, an example might be you go in for an interview and you want to appear like you're really sound, you're a great candidate, you dress up the right way, you hold your hands a certain way, you try to answer the questions in a way that you think will really respond in a way that's favorable to you getting that position. You clearly wouldn't want to come in dressed all shabby. You wouldn't want to be 100% honest. Um, I remember in an interview once a candidate saying something to the interview committee um, these questions all sound very staged and stilted and generic. Um, and it didn't make a good impression. I mean, he was being honest, but were we going to hire someone who made that kind of statement? Maybe not. So uh, it, it's just interesting to think of this in everyday life context because we're often doing this. We're presenting ourselves to others, but we often don't think of it as such. And thus the importance of applying an anthropological perspective here. If you've taken psychology, by the way, and you've studied symbolic interactionism, you also have covered this concept because symbolic interactionism is often focused on this notion that we present ourselves to others and those others might be powerful people in society. They could be parents or members of our religious groups, uh, or members of clergy. They could be people again in school or in medicine or in important fields. And thus we try to present ourselves to them in such a way that we think they will get a positive view of us. So Piaget and others talked about that self other kind of mirroring stage that we often engage in. So if you take in any social science I guarantee you'll encounter the work on the presentation of self, the work on the mirror stage, and so forth.
Now, one thing that's really cool about Goffman's work, and I've applied this in my own research on themed and immersive spaces, particularly working in the service industry and theme parks, he talked about the front and the backstage. So the front space, think of it as what the public sees. And so if you're at a restaurant, the public sees the front space, and hopefully everything that's presented to them there is going to really fit in with their image of what they think a nice restaurant should be. The backstage would be people cooking and doing other things behind the scenes to make sure things happen uh, out front. And we often say in our trainings in the service industry, at least we did in my theme park position years ago, that we try to really get people to understand that when you're on stage or front stage, as Goffman talks about, and you have guests around you, members of the public paying to enter the theme park, you shouldn't be cussing. You shouldn't be uh, disheveled in terms of your dress. You should be acting in such a way that people will feel that you're meeting their needs. And so if you've worked in the service industry, you know a lot about this because the service industry is really based foundationally on Goffman's notions of the front and the backstage as well as the presentation of self. All those training seminars that you may have participated in or trained as I did years ago in the theme park industry are all about things like they say here, the doctor's coat, um, the dancer's dress, a waiter's convivial smile. So that front that we talk about, the aspects of the costume that is connected to your body is really part and parcel of understanding what Goffman was talking about here in terms of the presentation of self and what he called impression management. We try to manage the impressions of others by presenting ourselves in a particular way. So super, super interesting. So this week I'd really like to see us talk about these notions of uh, performance. There's an interesting anecdote, and I think it was Sartre, the philosopher, once talked about someone was, um, they were in a restaurant and this uh, French waiter was doing this right here, uh, talking about sincere performers and authenticity, was being very effusive and over the top and serving them in a way that he thought was appropriate. Uh, Sartre's response was that, it was too over the top, and it appeared to him to be in, inauthentic. So I think what's interesting relating that anecdote to what they mentioned in this paragraph is it may be sometimes very difficult for us to pinpoint what a sincere or authentic performance is, say, as a waiter or a server in a restaurant or in a bar, versus one that's seen, as they say here, cynical, or maybe someone's being a smart ass because they're really upset with the person. And so they're actually talking in a way that won't get them fired, but is giving some sense of uh, flexing towards those customers and maybe saying things that, that will come off as inappropriate or rude because they're not really enjoying how the customers or the guests are treating them. So that dichotomy between the performance, if you will, the interactions, the behaviors, senses of authenticity between someone performing say in the service industry, a server, and someone who is the guest, I think is really, really curious and something we should study this week. So feel free to be, bring in your own um, experiences that you've had in the service industry, whatever those might be. Now, the discussion of curated personalities online, I think is really interesting. So you can think about how social media maybe forces us um, to act in certain ways. I'm thinking of the show on uh, Hulu, I think her name is uh, Charlie D'Amelio, and uh, kind of a dancer. Uh, they're two sisters. One's a dancer, one's a singer, and they're super big on Hulu. Like maybe at, at the time of making their reality TV show on Hulu, on TikTok rather, where they perform and do their short videos, they got the show on Hulu. But at the time um, when the show came out on Hulu, they were two, I think the very two top most um, important, if you will, or most influential personalities on TikTok. One of the things that's interesting about the reality TV show is how much they often talk about both of these topics here, the curated persona and the performance of gender. So in the one sense, they feel like they have to perform a certain way, and then they often get upset because a lot of their fans out there will say terrible things about them. And then the other sense, they're constantly talking about how they have to perform in a certain way as young women, and that thus there's a genderedness to their performance. And that show I thought was interesting because they really brought out a lot of psychological concerns, issues related to body image, and I was just really surprised to see that in that show. But that's great to see because so much of what happens online connects to both gender and to the issue of body image. So I would encourage you this week to think maybe about your own social media experiences, as well as some of these shows that are interesting 
interesting, these reality TV shows like the one I mentioned, because they're starting to really look more critically at some of these issues. And that could be a sign of the times. In 2021, there's a lot of concern about the power of Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg and the movement to the metaverse as they change their name to Meta as a, as a company. So a lot to consider. Now, the performance of gender is also a really key one to look at. And Judith Butler, the famous literary critic, is mentioned here, and I also have included a lecture of hers to talk about this idea of gender performativity. The idea that gender is a social construct, and in various ways, on various stages, metaphorical stages, we're asked to perform a certain way. So if you're a woman, maybe you have to sit or act a certain way or talk a certain way versus a man. And what we should really begin to do is to deconstruct and challenge these notions of gender. I think many in this class will appreciate that now gender is seen as a more fluid construct, as we talked about in earlier chapters. So hopefully, likewise, those performances of gender can be seen as those which are constructs and not necessarily truths that should hold us to dichotomous notions of male and female. We know that gender is not just performed, but it's very fluid and often ambiguous and certainly is socially constructed. And as a more fluid concept, hopefully we can start to deconstruct some of these notions of gender performances that unfortunately hold people to certain standards that need to be broken down and dismantled, as Margaret Mead discussed in her work in Papua New Guinea. Two really good case studies here, one on small town beauty pageants to talk about the constructions of gender, and then right after that, you have a study of the Brazilian art tradition of capoeira, which is a very famous form of dance and performance that I encourage you to look at. And by the way, that's under the section talking about social drama as a performance through the work of, of Victor Turner. I've talked about the work of Victor Turner with symbols with you in the past. And in fact, he talked about how symbols instigate social action. So if someone does something powerful, with a symbol. It could be a flag, it could be um, the American anthem, all the discussion of race and uh, people taking a knee during the anthem and how much you know controversy that's stirred up in at least American society. That's an example of how something like the anthem is symbolic and thus in Turner's mind it creates social act action or instigates social action. So we can start to talk about here how social reality is directly connected to performance. As they say here, a political process song that moves people to action resulting in the overthrow of a government regime would be an example of how performance could help um, instigate social action, to quote Turner's ideas. Um, the group Pussy Riot from Russia is an example, I think, of taking on Putin and the Russian government. So you could definitely see how a lot of performers for acting something out politically could be jailed for life, tortured, or killed. So it's certainly something that is precarious in terms of how it connects to forms of social reality. Now, the linguistic theorist, social critic, J.L. Austin talked about the idea of performativity. And so utterances are more than descriptive. They can actually bring out actions or outcomes by the virtue of how they are spoken. So it's important to think about this. If you speak a certain way as they give in these two examples here, that very action then can maybe result in you getting something or not getting something. It makes me think of all these shows on Netflix and Hulu and HBO about con artists or confidence artists, how they use often extreme forms of performance and notions of linguistic utterance to get what they want. So they say th certain things, they maybe get investments, and then they um, end up um, swindling people because they have such charisma and such command with language. And you might think of examples of that from your own life experiences and, and talk about this in terms of your experiences. We can also talk about ritual as a form of performance. Again, it really makes me think of the study of Victor Turner. And as they mentioned here, you can actually perform ethnographies. So what they said here. Um, in Turner's case, students performed um, a different wedding ceremony. And then based on those performances, other students could come in and critique them. So Turner really pioneered this with his collaborations with Richard Schechner from the world of theater. And I think performing ethnography is really interesting and unique. And also, by the way, Edie Turner was very much involved. Uh, Victor's wife, Victor passed away some years ago. Um, Edie was, was also very much involved in, in these efforts with Victor Turner. Now, political performance, I think, is also key. So they mention everything here from uh, Hitler Youth and Nazi era Germany to uh, examples of individuals, you know, raising their hands in protests at the Olympics. Again, Colin Kaepernick, who's mentioned here, is another example of this. 
we sometimes talk about rituals connected to hegemonic discourses. Again, hegemony is a form of power that's embedded in institutions. And I think people use sometimes the performance uh, arenas of sports as an opportunity to really get attention to a cause. BLM or Black Lives Matter, that really played a big role in uh, the years before 2021 here, really is another example of using media and social media to project performance and political performance to a wider world. We can also talk about how performances are bounded. As they say here, although we're all performing a particular role or roles at any given time, there are moments of heightened reflexivity, that's where we think of ourselves very closely, that are more particularly recognizable in our vernacular or everyday understandings as being performance. These performances, like a play or a concert, are special because they are marked off from everyday activities, they're bounded and analyzable. So you could think examples of this where maybe a wedding is one example of a performance that is very bounded. There are maybe particular expectations, and as a result of that, you can really study it in some interesting ways to see exactly what people are doing, how they respond to certain scripts, literal or figurative, symbols, forms of ritual. They also bring up the work of Schechner here and talk about how you have a lot of rehearsal that's obviously a key part of any ritual or performance. In my Anthropology, Music, and Sound class, I talk about some of my own experiences in performance, um, doing some works in the past, and how ritual and rehearsal were a key part of getting ready for that performance. So a lot to consider here, particularly if you've done your own performance work in whatever settings those might have been. Now there's also a discussion here of framing performance. And so you could think as they talk about here, if you're sitting in a classroom, that is a particular frame. As Richard Bauman has said, uh, framing devices are cues that signify that the ensuing text is a bounded unit that may be objectified. So you can think of what they call this meta-communicative element, where there's multi-layered information given to you because of the frame. So if you're in a classroom, you know there's a teacher there, you know there are students, there are certain phrases or rituals or performances that go on, and because of that framing, that itself tells you something about the performance and allows you to do an analysis of it. We can also talk about meaning, and this goes back to the idea of the interpretation of performance that we, got, we could all get into. We can talk about performances being polysemic, meaning that there are multiple meanings or signs that can be applied to understanding a performance. And this really comes from the work of Victor Turner as well. He talked about symbols as being multi-referential and the idea that they had a lot of different poles of experience and meaning that they signified or that they related to. We can think of this with the American flag. For some people, the American American flag is a symbol of patriotism. For other people, it could be a symbol of oppression. So every symbol out there has multiple frames that are polysemic and also multi-referential. And actually, I was going to say a great example of that is very recently here in 2021, I had a chance to see the show Hamilton in Reno, Nevada. And let me tell you, this was an amazing, amazing performance. And what was really great about it is I'm just reminded of this idea of um, the polysemic nature of performance and multi-referentiality. What's really amazing about Hamilton is it's people in the present, if you will, people who are not part of the founding fathers, in other words, non-white males, the founding fathers basically were white males. So what um, Lin-Manuel Miranda talked about in creating Hamilton is people of today trying to play the roles or reinterpret the past. So you get all these multiple layers of political meaning about race. There are interesting messages about gender. And then using rap, R&B, and hip-hop um, specifically to go back to framing also takes you into this new kind of cognitive level as an audience member. You're really forced to see um, Aaron Burr and um, Alexander Hamilton like performing in a rap battle when they're debating things um, in front of the, the Constitutional Congress. And of course, that didn't really happen that way. But by reinterpreting in this way, you're applying new meaning and you're playing with notions of framing. You're playing with notions of staging and characters and performance. So if you get a chance to see a super complex work like something like Hamilton, you can really begin to appreciate why anthropologists study performance because it has all these multiple layers. Now, the work of Augusto Boel is actually really significant. I had a chance years ago at a performance studies conference at NYU. And by the way, Richard Schechner was one of the speakers there. I had a chance to 
uh, take part in a workshop using the Boelian technique. And it's a really interesting approach that allows you to create um, dialogues about power, about situations of power in society, by getting everyone who's a part of the workshop performing in those, um, in those workshops as you would in a theatrical play. And it's based on the important work of the Brazilian uh, late theorist of pedagogy, Paulo uh, Freire, who wrote um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed and many other works. So Boel was really interested in taking Freire's work and applying it to a theatrical stage and getting people to look at forms of power in everyday life that they experience and often were unaware of. So there's a lot of great and really rich and classic references in this chapter. We can also think about recontextualizing performances. They mention the work here of Clifford Geertz, understanding a culture as a text. And the intertextuality is also an example of something you see in the work Hamilton. So what's really interesting about Hamilton, as I was watching it, and I'm, I enjoy Broadway. I'm not a big, you know, I don't know a lot of classic Broadway shows. But I was very interested at the end of Hamilton, there was this really lengthy list of credits. And it says here... The score of Hamilton contains references to the following classics, and it goes on to two pages, and they list a legal representative who actually did all the clearance. And I thought, well, this is quite amazing, because what Lin-Manuel Miranda and the others involved in the creation of Hamilton are doing is creating intertextuality. So it means they reference another song from another Broadway musical or an RB song, and they bring that into their show, and thus they're taking these cultural texts that may or may not be familiar to us, and they're remixing them, and they're remaking them in what we call these intertextual moments. And so, again, performance can really do some amazing things, some things maybe that you're not even aware of when you're when you're watching it. And I certainly wasn't aware of all those references, and when I saw them, I said that encourages me to go back and look at all the multiple references that Hamilton and Lynn manuel Miranda are are playing on there. So a lot of interesting examples here. They even get into film here and the Western and parodies of the Western and um, talking about, again, source materials, relationships. Um, each performance is situated in a web of relationship with previous performances. Again, Hamilton is a great example of that. Another way in which uh, they do this is through reference to classical music and even the Beatles. There's a song called You'll Be Back, sung by the King at the time, who's basically, it's kind of a, a strange, creepy song, but it, it really feels like a Beatles song. And if you look at the structure of it, if you look at even the lyrics, uh, the verses, the chorus, it really feels very much like a Beatles song. And so in that sense, there is definitely uh, referencing back to the intertextuality, if you will, with, with the Beatles. We can also, and I'm moving through some of this quickly here, I know it's a pretty long chapter, but we can also talk about performance communities. Cultural performances are informed by the norms of one's community of practice and signal one's membership with those communities. Uh, back in the day, I remember being part of a music fraternity in school in a number of my um, graduate and undergraduate programs, and we had specific rituals that we performed, kind of secret rituals. We had a secret handshake. Um, and, and the ritual itself was really based on, on Greek myth. And I found that part of it interesting because the idea is that you develop that sense of what Turner called communities, where you have a sense of identity because you're initiates. As we talked in the chapter about the rite of passage, when you go through a rite of passage together, and certainly a music fraternity is not like a social fraternity. And I know hazing has been cracked down on uh, throughout the United States because of alcohol deaths and so forth. But often fraternities and sororities have various rituals that create a sense of communities or esprit de corps or shared identity amongst a group who, who goes through that same process of the initiation. Now, in the era of globalization, we can talk about how performance has differed and how it's it's changing. The work of Arjuna Padurai, very famous cultural theorist, is important because he talked about the flow of media across different scapes. He talked about media scapes and technoscapes and other scapes, if you will. So the idea is that you might watch a certain show in one country and see it in another. And today's day and age, with the social media world as well as the media choices, you can subscribe to all British TV shows if you want, say on Hulu. Netflix has one of the most famous, if not highest grossing and most watched show of all time, uh, Squid Games, uh, coming in, uh, what, 2020, 2021. And that's an example there how a South Korean form of cinema can really get a lot of acclaim. As well, the film Parasite won most of the Academy Awards a few years back, and it's another example of 
people getting interested in something because of this global scene that Arjuna Potterai talks about in terms of global performances. So I'd encourage you this week to talk about how globalization has led to new forms of performance and have maybe has really changed the way we think about the world in terms of our understandings of performance. So really lengthy chapter, but a lot of interesting ideas. I wanted to mention one more concept. And specifically, this chapter makes me think of the idea of spectacle. This is a book called Spectacle by David Rockwell and Bruce Mao, who are actually design specialists, but they were very much interested in um, spectacles that had a very iconic nature to them. For example, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech back in the day. Um, other examples here of religious rituals in sacred sites. Um, I'm trying to think of some others here. They have so many cool examples. Um, celebrations that happen. Even, um, you know, things like, like Burning Man. I think Burning Man would be a great example of a performance that you could experience that has a ton of what we talk about in this chapter. The presentation of self, front and backstage, um, identity, connection to intertext, and so forth. In fact, if you want, go back to our, our uh, module on rituals and religion, and you can look at the Burning Man articles there and specifically tie it to this uh, focus this week on, on performance. So I really love this chapter. I hope you'll really get into it because there's just so much rich stuff to consider. Now, in addition to the chapter, check out the work here of Victor and Edie Turner, The Anthropology of Performance. I just wanted to give you a sense because they reference their work so much here of what this looks like in the academic frame of reading it in the original source. Now let's jump to our second topic for the week and our second chapter focused on medical anthropology. And there are anthropologists out there, by the way, who specialize in medical anthropology and they classify themselves as medical anthropologists. And I think more and more, as we're seeing a lot of these issues, even before COVID-19, but certainly with COVID-19, we have a lot of concerns about this relationship between biology and culture that we'll be framing here through medical anthropology. So you're going to be looking at chapter 17, and these are the objectives that you can consider from chapter 17. Again, this biomedical perspective we'll really be talking about. We want to look at the interactions between biology and culture. It's super important. We'll consider in just a second here some examples of that, how it relates to our crisis now with COVID-19 as it continues in 2021. So we can click on chapter 17 to get more into what medical anthropology involves. And this is a great opportunity, like with our last chapter in performance, to really think critically about our own experiences with health and medicine. There's just so much great stuff to consider. This idea of what is healthy and what is not, I think, is really interesting. We can look at American society and our diet and some of our issues with diet and maybe obesity and diabetes and other issues, again, even pre-COVID, and ask some critical questions about whether our lifestyle is um, out of balance, not just in terms of our own bodies, but in terms of what's happening with the environment. I was watching David Chang's recent show on the next thing you'll eat, I think it's called. And a lot of it talks about the sobering realities of our dietary choices, not just in terms of health effects on us, but in terms of the planet. Some of the stuff that's happened at the uh, Copenhagen 26 conference here in 2021 that had a lot of mixed reviews because some people felt like not enough critical focus on the environment and the lack of sustainability of our culture and many other cultures out there. Not enough of that was happening. And that will lead us directly into next week's conversations about the Anthropocene and globalization. So they mention here the World Health Organization and they talk about how um, various factors influence our health, which could be where we live, the state of our environment, if we live next to, say, a chemical plant or something, our genetics, our income, education level, relationships with friends and family. So these are all very important and key in understanding conditions of health as well as constructions of health that we could talk about to go back to the last chapter on performance. So medical anthropology is that subspecialization within anthropology, cultural anthropology, as well as biological anthropology, that investigates human health and healthcare systems in a comparative perspective. It considers a wide range of the perceived causes of illness, as well as the techniques and treatments developed in different cultures and society to address health concerns. Using cultural relativism and a comparative approach, medical anthropologists seek to understand how ideas about health, illness, and the body are products of a particular social and cultural context. And the, this is a great definition of this, and the focus on the comparative and the relativistic approach is key. So when we compare our medical practices with those of another culture, 
we don't necessarily want to condemn the practices of the other culture just because they're different. Now, that does get tricky, and we'll talk about this week perhaps how with vaccine misinformation and a lot of people being upset about masking protocols and so forth, it maybe is not the case that we just accept that whatever someone on talk radio says, like Joe Rogan, that that's necessarily the truth in terms of what we should be doing with our bodies, in terms of that horse drug that uh, some of these people on social media were talking about prescribing for us. So it does get tricky, as we'll talk about at the end of our conversation today. Now, the number one thing you can get from this chapter is this focus on the biocultural perspective. Again, the idea is that we are biocultural. Um, our lifestyles are products of the interactions between biology and culture. We can think of situations where we are adaptive in terms of our practices, or maybe our dietary practices, and we're maladaptive. So if we're eating a ton of sugar, if we're eating a ton of salt and saturated fat and really bad stuff for our bodies, we could say our culture is maladaptive, as they talk about here, because in the United States, we often talk about this as a disease of civilization. We have all these fast food restaurants and other kind of processed foods that we eat, maybe because they're cheap, maybe because they taste really good, maybe because they're easy and we don't have to prepare them. And as a result, we talk about that as being maladaptive or negative to our bodies and the environment, even though it's something that emerges through what seem to be our natural cultural behaviors, like going to the grocery store and buying processed foods from the frozen aisle or going to our favorite fast food restaurant and eating and consuming things that are maybe not great for us. So the biocultural perspective is going to look at the interplay of biology and culture. So in this example of fast food and processed foods, we could say that the cultural emphasis on quickness, on maybe we don't have enough time to eat a healthy meal, so we go through the drive through at Taco Bell or a favorite fast food restaurant, and we eat it, but it's bad for our body. So at that moment, that example of fast food is both biological and cultural. It's biological for the impact on our bodies, and it's cultural because there are really legitimate reasons as to why we have fast food. And a lot of people would say, to go back to the who's definition of health, our income level impacts what we eat. So if fast food is cheaper than some other healthy food options out there, we can again blame economic inequality and social stratification for some of the biological reasons that we're getting into here that are negative or maladaptive. So fast food is much more complex, I think, than social critics often play it out as. It's not just something as simple as there's this crappy food that's bad for us and we like it. That's a little part of it, but there's much more, and that much more there is really the cultural underbedding that makes fast food maladaptive biologically in terms of our bodies as well as in terms of our environments. If you look at how cattle has such a huge resource drain on us in terms of having to pay for all that carbon that goes and comes out of cattle just to have a hamburger. So it's it's it, it's definitely a lot to think of this week. And by the way, I think there'll be a lot of, you know, controversy. So let's just be kind with one another as we disagree on some of these points, because certainly this gets very political when we get into the politics of our bodies and food. So ethnomedicine, very important in medical anthropology. It's a comparative study of cultural ideas about illness and healing. So for example, we could look at traditional Tibetan medicine and compare it and say, this is how it compares to our medical system. We often think about our medical system as biomedical. We see illnesses as the result of very specific identifiable agents. In other cultures, it might be related to something else like a ghost or some form of magic that causes someone to get ill. So we have to be really open again to cultural relativism and a perspective that allows us to make connections between our own cultural practices in terms of medicine, the body, health, food, diet, and those of other cultures that we're not a part of. We can also talk about ethno-etiology. Etiology refers to explanation. So we're talking about cultural explanations about the causes of health problems. So very interesting to think about. And by the way, during COVID-19, this one gets very tricky when we talk about specifically the United States and people having perceptions about health, again, based on what they read on social media. They're not doctors per se or nurses, but yet they're getting this information and they're treating it as the truth and making decisions about themselves and others that puts all of us at risk because we are breathing the same air as the next person who either has decided to get vaccinated, to wear a mask, and to, po to practice positive health practices based on the CDC and other organizations, or 
those who've decided, no, I'm not going to do it because I'm a medical intuitive or I'm someone who believes it's just wrong for me. That's a decision you've made, but it's likely a very selfish decision because you're not thinking about your relationship to other people around you who breathe the exact same air and who could get sick and indeed die. Over 5 million since the making of this video here in 2021 in November have died worldwide. And that's a that's certainly a ton of people to base a decision on someone who doesn't have any medical training or scientific training, who's just spouting something on Facebook, on social media, on YouTube, etc. So these ethnoetiologies, these cultural explanations for illness could involve different factors. They could be naturalistic and personalistic. Personalistic might be the idea that there's an active intervention of an agent. It could be a human, a witch, a sorcerer, a ghost, an ancestor, evil spirit, or even a deity. So the idea that someone gets ill because of something karmic, because of something that happened to them, because of something they did, I think would be an example of a personalistic um, explanation. Um, I ha kind of have an example of this. So I have a family member with a very uh, serious condition. It's called a glioblastoma multiform. It's a stage four brain cancer. And I think of a conversation that someone had with this person, and I'm trying to just protect the identities of everyone involved here. I'm not getting too specific, but I'll just say that this has definitely impacted me over the last five years or so dealing with this um, very aggressive form of brain cancer. But one person in particular told this individual with brain cancer that she was likely um, came down with this because of stress, because of having stress. And this reminded me of a personalistic explanation. It was really rude. Like when I heard it, I thought, how on earth would you say that to someone? But then my realization was as an anthropologist, People often say wrong-headed things or have explanations that don't make sense. And indeed, if you study any particular disease, one of the things you can do is go to the Mayo Clinic or other sites, again, reputable sites, and learn about diseases. And you discover that some diseases actually have totally naturalistic causes, could be related to genetics, to mutation, but um, don't necessarily have a clear cause. So it's never the case that we can say if someone smokes, they're always going to get lung cancer or that everybody who has lung cancer was a smoker. We know that's often not the case. So that's what gets very tricky about medicine and health is sometimes we have explanations that aren't accurate explanations or explanations that maybe even come off as offensive to the people involved in those serious diseases. So the naturalistic explanations that maybe we're more familiar with are the ideas that natural forces, cold, heat, wind, dampness, an upset in the balance of the body's basic function, like in Chinese traditional medicine, could be the cause of an ailment that we have. Um, we also have notions, like sometimes we'll say, someone has the cold, and they'll say, well, I was cold, and so I got the cold. Well, no, you got a virus that is in your body, and being cold doesn't necessarily mean that that was the reason that now your immune system might have been down when you were cold or you weren't drinking enough water or something. But it's very interesting when we get into explanations and we sometimes um, have explanations that don't necessarily say factor in or connect with like the official scientific explanations. And that very issue right there is I think where we're at right now in the U.S. and many other countries in 2021 talking about COVID-19 and all these controversies and people not wanting to get vaccinated and people having conspiracy theories that if you get vaccinated, you have a government tracking device in, inside of your body or something. Um, now, this example here of the Zonde is one we talked about in our magic and witchcraft chapter. So this is that exact granary story that I talked about and that we also related to that sinkhole story. So some of this actually ties back with our previous chapter on, on religion, curiously enough. So the question becomes, is Western biomedical approaches or biomedicine an ethnoetiology? What do we call it? And they say here, the biomedical approach to health strikes many people, including those in the U.S., as the best or at least the most fact-based approach to medicine. This is largely because Western biomedicine is based on applications from science, biology, chemistry, to the diagnosis and treatment of medical conditions. So I think the question is, you know, because you have science backing you up, if you will, does that mean that people will, if you will, believe or understand what you're saying? Now, I think the case of COVID-19 in 2021 
is a fairly clear indication that science is not necessarily trusted and medicine is not necessarily trusted. As a result, I think we have some real challenges. So uh, as they say here, all ethnoetiologies are rooted in shared cultural perceptions about the way the world works. Western biomedical practitioners would correctly observe the strength of Western biomedicine is derived from the use of scientific method that emphasizes objectively observable facts. However, this would not be particularly persuasive to someone whose culture uses a different explanation. And this is where I'm thinking COVID-19 connects because so many people, it seems, have been led astray by these assumptions online that people have said this might cause. I mean, I'm thinking of Trump had this group of doctors and there was this woman from Houston, Texas, Stella Emanuel. And these people were purportedly MDs. But she started talking about demon sperm. I kid you not, you could look up this speech and how demon sperm somehow related to COVID. And, you know, I'm watching this thinking like, we probably don't need a discussion of demon sperm right now as we're trying to cure a disease that is really one of the most aggressive respiratory diseases we've seen in a long time. Now, we know there's a lot of different um, approaches out there uh, with healing approaches. And this is, I think, gets kind of interesting. So you have humoral healing and communal healing. You have um, different techniques where people can lay energies on your body and those energies can somehow cure you and so forth. Again, I would apply cultural relativism here. I would say that if you're getting a treatment that's alternative and you start thinking about the connection to the placebo effect or faith, I think it's perfectly fine. If you're not being duped, if you're not maybe paying a lot of money or you're not losing money because you're getting some kind of alternative treatment, that's fine. Um, to go back to this case of the glioblastoma, when this loved one of mine was diagnosed, someone uh, approached me and said, would you like to do a healing involving angels? And I said, no, 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 thank you. We have our own approaches, but I, I appreciate the offer. So I was trying to be sensitive to the person and their belief in healing angels and those techniques. Again, I have no issue with the person practicing that as long as they're not harming someone or taking their money or whatever. Um, but, you know, it's not my personal thing and not my loved one's personal thing. So I kindly said no, but I tried to respect that person's opinion and realize, okay, not everybody has the same view when it comes to healing and even um, conditions like the glioblastoma, stage four cancer. So faith in the placebo effect is kind of interesting. And a medical anthropologist named Daniel Mormon, um, ages ago in the 80s, I read some of his work as um, a first year student in this very class, cultural anthropology. And he studied the placebo effect and said in many cultures, because you think something is helping you, it actually can help you. So Going back to the angel healing and so forth, if that stuff helps you, if those treatments help you, and it's just yourself, and maybe you're not doing this to avoid other kinds of care that could save your life or the life of a loved one, um, if it's to give you um, good mental health and positive thoughts, that's great. I do have an issue, though, if someone says, I'm going to deny my child medical treatment because of my religious beliefs. I think at that point, personally, um, someone needs to step in and say, no, um, you, you can't let this child die because of your beliefs if we know there's a curable way to deal with this. Now, getting into end-of-life issues and terminal conditions, um, it's a much different matter, and I think a different conversation has to be had. But if it's a curable illness or something that someone can be saved using any form of medicine that we're talking about here, ethnomedicine, Western medicine, then that should be used. Now, in the case of COVID-19, again, my thought is we're getting into a situation where a lot of folk notions and folk cures and social media accounts are really harming us. There's zero scientific evidence that any of that is true. There are no peer-reviewed articles in scientific journals that talk about bleach and UV light as curing COVID. So the fact that someone like that says this and influences people is very scary. And the scary part is if it's just yourself, if you say, I'm not going to get vaccinated, I'm not going to mask myself, I have COVID-19, but I'm going to sit in my cabin and I'm not in touch with the outside world, no one else is breathing the air that I'm breathing, I would say that's great. I, it's a dumb choice. It's a wrong-headed choice, but that's your choice. But the minute you step on a subway or the minute you get into a college classroom and you breathe on the rest of us and you haven't been vaccinated and you're not following mass protocols, then that goes to a much different issue because we're talking about our society and our social groups that breathe the same air literally and figuratively. So get off my soapbox there a little bit, but 
This is really key because I think we're at a point right now where we're believing a lot of these alternative and false cures and notions being propagated by even mainstream media, even Fox News and Newsmax and organizations that certainly should know better as we're trying to deal with COVID-19. Now, mental health is a really key topic here. And in particular, I'd really encourage us to look at mental health and why mental health has not been prioritized as a bigger issue in the United States. I think we're finally getting over the stigma of mental health and some of the media here could talk about this. Um, you look at someone like Michael Phelps, who's the most successful Olympian swimmer of all time. And uh, he recently talked about mental health struggles. Um, a bunch of famous models and actresses and singers recently also got into social media and talked about their own mental health struggles. I talked earlier about the D'Amelio show on Hulu, and so much of that show focuses on mental health and challenges that young people deal with via the world of social media to kind of connect this to the chapter on performance, which might be an interesting connection for us. So this week, I really encourage us to think more critically about mental health and why mental health isn't prioritized, say, in the United States. Connected to that, we could talk about cultural bound syndromes. And these are syndromes that are very specific to a certain culture. So maybe one that has uh, dietary issues, like our culture would be one. Anorexia is one as well. We could talk about this because we know that a lot of social media is encouraging young boys and girls, maybe more particularly, to starve themselves and look a particular way. And as a result, again, we could say that's a culture-bound syndrome. It's maladaptive. It's an example of how the body biology is reacting to not eating or eating certain ways, binging and throwing up or vomiting, and then the cultural conditions of social media and media expectations to go back to the performance chapter of Butler and the performativity of gender are also rooted in this. So again, at every moment here, let's use, whether it's anorexia or other examples like diabetes or obesity in the U.S., let's use that biocultural perspective to connect biology and culture to one another. So great examples here, including the case of uh, frog swallowing in Brazil that you can check out. So you can kind of a contrast there. We can also talk about biomedical technologies. So infectious diseases, very key, talking about the epidemiological tradition. This was a moment in health where because we started to control epidemics, we saw a sharp drop in mortality rates, particularly among children. So this is, again, the result of science and vaccination and immunization. So right now, as I'm recording this, actually two days ago, I got my, sorry, one day ago, I got my uh, COVID-19 booster. I'm feeling kind of a little queasy and less energetic today, but I realize that it's important to get that third booster. And who knows, there might be a fourth one coming as well. So immunization is so important to talk about, particularly in this time, as we're still dealing with the continued situation of COVID-19 in the United States and globally. This chapter, by the way, has a ton of just great and provocative case studies that, again, I think will spark a lot of debate. Reproductive technology here, a lot of discussion of how reproductive technology has been used. I think a little bit of the situation recently in Texas passing fairly strict abortion laws and how that's related to this political side of things. And if you've ever been to a pro-life, pro-choice rally of some sort, you know that a lot of that also connects to performance to go back to our last chapter to at least connect reproductive technologies and reproductive political rights issues to the notion of performance. So a lot of good stuff there as we conclude this chapter. I think you'll have a lot of provocative uh, conversations uh, with one another this week. Again, let's keep our debates nice um, as we talk about some of these issues where we don't agree. In terms of health and medicine, I've included a lot of good supplemental resources here. So you can check out these um, open anthropology projects that were focused specifically on the anthropology of medicine. Check out this one on pandemic perspectives. I'd love to hear about some of that in one of our discussion posts for the week. And then this very interesting interesting article on the theme of care and what care means in a Western medical sense. Now, again, I talked about this earlier, but if you look at any of the media out there, if you type in COVID-19 misinformation, you find multiple stories across the political aisles, all different kind of perspectives. But this particular study right now was very sobering for me to read. And it said that according to a study, it was um, of over 1,500 people I believe was the study. You can read the whole article here. 78% of the people studied believes or is unsure about at least one false statement and nearly a third believe at least four of eight false statements. So misconceptions that have been 
put out there on all sorts of uh, network news and some fringe news sites as well. So again, some sobering stuff for us to think about this week as we consider the challenges of dealing with this pandemic. Now, specific to the media for this week, I encourage you to look at some of the media I've included for you on performance. So this goes back to um, the performance chapter. Let me actually jump back to our module so I can cover these all in one moment here. So again, you'll just click on additional media for week nine. And we have the first set then is specific to, I believe most of those are specific, yeah, to performance. And the second set is focused on medical anthro. I won't go through all these, but if you want to learn more about the presentation of self, here's a great um, discussion of it. If you want to talk a little about, about reality TV and how it's a constructed performance and how it's affected the world, then you could check that out. Here's the work of Richard Schechner talking about performance studies and also theater and anthropology, the liminal period, as we've talked about, and then an introduction to performance processes, and then a little more on social media, conversation about performance and performativity to go back to Jill Austin, and then the work of Judith Butler talking about performance. And so a lot of great connections there to gender. Also, we talked about sports and activism as a form of performance. So this is, I think, a good media form that you can look at to understand that. And then as I talked about intertextuality this week, specific to Hamilton, if you want to see how intertextuality works in Hollywood and feature films, check out the video, Intertextuality, Hollywood's New Currency. The second part focuses on medical anthropology. So check out these videos that talk from the perspective of a medical anthropologist here or how medical anthropologists operate. You also have some conferences here about ethnomedicine that you can check out, Siberian shamans to look at, that placebo effect we talked about, a little bit here on mental health, and then to go back to our earlier conversations of culture-bound syndromes, you can look at obesity and this example here, discussion of culture-bound syndromes, and then it ends with a lot of focus on COVID-19. So if any of these jump out at you, if you want to connect these, these really match quite well with the two chapters, check out one of these media forums, post about that in your discussion for this week. And again, I think there's going to be a lot of provocative conversation here in week nine as we consider the chapter on performance and then also the chapter on medical anthropology. So that will be it this week for week nine lecture here in cultural anthropology. I'll be back next week with our week 10 lecture. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon.